well, it's interesting. All of us that kind of, we did it all separately. So Spike Peterson and Ann Tickner and the, a lot of us that kind of launched this, uh, Jan Petman in Australia, um, we didn't know we were launching this. And then we began to see each other at international studies meetings and we were laughing at some of the same jokes. That's very important. Um, we were outraged at some of the same foolish assertions and we were frustrated at some of the same lacks of interest um, and we began to find each other. And the first time I ever remember we were in London and we began to spot, we didn't know each other, we began spotting each other going to some of the same sessions and we began to kind of make eye contact and give a laugh or raise our eyebrows, that's always very important. Um, and so then we began to really talk together and we began to say, well, I'm doing this kind of thing and I'm doing, and we were all doing quite different things. And Tickner was really a political theorist about the state. Um, uh, Spike Peterson was doing political economy, especially in Africa. Um, and so we began really trading and then we, that's, I mean, that's how movements start, really, you know? You don't know you're starting a movement. Um, you just think you're frustrated by some of the same things or you're laughing, you know, at some of the same outrages. And, and, and so now looking back, what's I think really exciting is that there's so many more people. I mean, there is you, there are, there are just people in every country that I'm lucky enough to visit who are doing gender analysis of international politics from very different kinds of questions and different perspectives. And that's the good news. The good news, it's not the same of, I mean, we all still see each other, right? We're all still in touch with each other and we go out and have birthday dinners and, you know, we're really good buddies now. Um, but there's just many, many more now. And that's much more exciting. And a lot of us have now supervised dissertations by people doing gender and international relations, men and women. Yes, well, I, like any book, you, you start writing a book, well, unless it's your dissertation, which you have to write, and then you turn it into a book. But after that, you don't have to write a book. So you have to have some motivation for writing it. And what had happened bef just before I knew I was going to write the big book, I didn't know I was going to write it, was that I did an update of Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, mainly because my publisher wanted a new edition, and I said, no, no, you know, I don't go back and rewrite books. Other people can do that. But she said, no, no, please, you know, the people upstairs really <clears throat> need me to urge you to rewrite a new edition. So I went back and reread it. And two things struck me when I went back to look at the garment industry again, to look at diplomatic wives, to look at um, domestic workers um, and masculinity in politics. One of the things, the first thing that struck me was that a lot of things had changed. What had changed was there were so much more transnational women's organizing. That was really the big change between when I first wrote Bananas and when I went to rewrite it. And the second thing was so much had not changed. That global garment industries had figured out how to update what I was thinking of as patriarchy. And the diplomatic services of your country, my country, most countries, yes, they now had to deal with much more outspoken diplomatic wives, but they still expected wives of male ambassadors to do entertaining. That hadn't changed. So what struck me was the patriarchy, when I was redoing Bananas, patriarchy I found was so adaptable. It really can, it, it's modernized, not itself because it's not abstract. The people who have a vested interest in sustaining patriarchy have learned how to adapt. They adapted to women winning the right to vote, which they resisted mightily right, from the 1890s through the 1970s in Switzerland. They, but once women had the vote, they figured out how to use it. So I wrote um, 
this new book, The Big Push, which is about pushing patriarchs off the bench. <laughs> That's the big, the big push. Um, I wrote it because I had discovered from rewriting Bananas how adaptable patriarchy was. So the sustainable patriarchy is to deliberately use that term that we mainly think is positive. We think that sustainability is what you want in agriculture. Sustainability is what you want in urban redevelopment. You want sustainability. But in fact, you only want things to be sustained that are positive. But sustainability can, up, you know, you can have authoritarian sustainability, you know, Mugabe until recently. Right? You can sustain things that are really detrimental to democracy and that uh, sustain and perpetuate sexism. So I deliberately took a positive turn in order to kind of wake us all up as to how adaptable uh, patriarchal mechanisms, patriarchal attitudes, patriarchal um, structures, how adaptable they've been. Not to, not to discourage us, but to wake us up and be more energetic and realize why women's movements probably are never going to be able to stop. That's the good news. That's the, you know, you have to have stamina every morning. So there is a hope for change. There's always hope for change, right? I mean, I think the ways patriarchy gets sustained is by trying to persuade us it's, there's no use. Don't try to change masculinities. And this is why the whole Me Too hashtag is so interesting, is that you do have to transform ideas about masculinities. You do have to transform ideas about femininities. And it's always hopeful. But look out, because patriarchy depends on us burning out. Yes, I mean, I think every, you know, there's a lot of motivation within institutions, even institutions we like. You know, whether it be the WHO or the UNPKO, maybe we like that or not, UN Peacekeeping Organization, or Doctors Without Borders. I mean, these are, the, these are the good guys in the world, right? These are not organizations that we usually are critical of, like the IMF and the World Bank and NATO, right? These are these other organizations. But within them, there is an inertia that wants to continue to do things the way they've always done them. And that's why I told that story in there of the woman where I couldn't even name her organization, but it's one of the good organizations. And she came to a meeting that I was at. And it's always during coffee breaks. You know, during coffee breaks, you have some of the best conversations because people aren't on record. And it's friendly and people can be more um, candid. And that's when she told me that this very big organization that she works for, that I usually think of as a good organization, she said, she's the gender focal point within it. And she said, they think that that means that she does women. That's what she does. That she, they don't imagine that she's actually going to critique the masculinized ways in which they do planning or the masculinized ways in which they do rescue work. She doesn't, you know, so she said, Yes, I'm a gender focal point, but I already had a full-time job in this organization, and they thought the gender focal point was something you just lacked on top. Well, that's how patriarchy works. They're now forced to have a gender focal point. So what do you do? You find a woman, of course it has to be a woman, you find a woman who already has a full-time job, and then you add this to her job description. Perfect. You know, it's impossible for her to ever get anything done, especially if the guys upstairs won't listen to her anyway. So that's how you update patriarchy inside a good organization. Well, I guess I'll go to the end of the question first. <laughs> and that is to be a researcher, to be an academic researcher or an NGO researcher, there are a lot of ways to be a feminist researcher. Be sure you never lose touch with people doing the act activism. Be sure you're always 
in touch with, learning from, listening to um, activist advocates because they usually can tell you more about where the resistance is. They can tell you more about what tokenism looks like. That it's, so for me, it's really been important. One of the groups that I've worked the most with, and it's mainly because they kind of mobilized me. They began reading some of my things, but then they began inviting me to, org to organizational meetings, not just so that I could blah, blah, but so that I would listen to what they were doing and learn from them. And that's the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I don't know whether there's a WILP um, organization here in the Czech Republic. Um, it's in about 56 countries, um, but it's headquarters in Geneva. And the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom is the oldest women's transnational peace organization in the world. It was founded during World War I in 1915, and they first met at The Hague. Um, and they're still very active. And they were one of the groups behind 1325. So one of the things that I've learned about the actual implementation of UN Resolution 1325 of the Security Council, I've learned from people in Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and all their allies um, who do this important work around the world to try and implement 1325. And what they constantly say is, this is what tokenism looks like. They try to shrink us down to advocating just more women in the militarized peace units that are sent. Said that's not what we advocated for. We advocated for women's experiences to be integrated at the core of any peacemaking operation and any peace building uh, program and said that's what no international official wants to do. So yeah, learn from activists. Well, she's saying, I think Madeline Reese is a very important, she's herself a British feminist international lawyer, right? And she, I think, learned a lot because she was Mary Robinson's deputy in Sarajevo in the late 90s after the Dayton so-called peace accords, which no Bosnian feminist would call a peace accord, but the Dayton peace accord. And she was there and she saw the extent to which the economics, the political economics of rebuilding, the remasculinize a society. And so she is now working with women in the Ukraine, women in Syria, women still in Bosnia, very much so, to bring Wilp's influence um, and resources together to say, yes, we have to think about a feminist understanding of security. Um, which is much more complex than simply militarized security. But we also have to watch what happens after wars in Colombia, in Bosnia. Well, the war isn't over in Ukraine, um, and the war certainly isn't over in Syria. But when and if it is wound down, then how do you make sure that patriarchy isn't the core of the rebuilding effort? And that's what Madeleine Reese and others now, Carol Cohn, um, uh, in the United States are also pushing for. Well, yes, I mean, I, and you are not the only militarized region of the world, right? I mean, Asia, Asian feminists are having to really critique the hyper-militarization that's going now on in East Asia. So listen to Czech feminists should listen to South Korean feminists, right? Um, Polish feminists should listen to Japanese feminists. Swedish feminists should listen to Hong Kong feminists. I mean, really, this, this next time you have conversations, have conversations across regions so that one doesn't slip in to imagine that somehow Central Europe 
as it's trying to deal with Putin's regime in Russia is somehow peculiar. Talk to Turkish feminists about militarism, right? That this, these, these conversations are really crucial because otherwise one slips into imagining that they are regional, um, unique um, forms of militarization. They're not. And not to mention, of course, the Canadian feminists having to deal with the American regime, right? So the reason why it's important for feminist analysis right at the, this point, right now, um, to be part of any discussion of militarization is because you cannot militarize popular opinion unless you can persuade women to shrink their notions of security down to militarized security. Militarized security is not expansive, it is shrunken. It is a very narrow, a very unrealistic notion of where real security comes from. And the, that is the big insight, the major fundamental, I would say radical, radical means at the core, radical insight of feminists about security. That security through militarized security is a shrunken, unrealistic notion of security because it doesn't make anybody feel more secure. It promotes a certain kind of manliness, which then marginalizes many men. I mean, the, the masculinization of militarism is not about all men's varied forms of masculinity. It's promoting one, maybe two kinds, the strategist kind of masculinity and the infantryman's masculinity. And those are two kinds, and they're supposed to be compatible. All right, they're supposed to be mutually fulfilling. But what it leaves out are all the other kinds of manliness that men would like to feel are part of their own growth. And it's feminists who expose that. I mean, all the work that's being done on militarized masculinity now, the most important work is being done by women and men who take feminist understandings of gender and of security seriously. So you cannot have a serious conversation about how people in the Czech Republic are becoming militarized or people in Ukraine are becoming militarized, or in Sweden. There's a lot of worry in Sweden about militarization now. You cannot have that conversation that's productive unless you ask feminist questions about the militarization of women and the militarization of men. And they need to be public discussions so that people can weigh them and be aware of what they're being pushed to absorb without thinking. Mm -hmm.